for the most part, what it's doing is intercepting high altitude bomber formations escorted by zeros. They're fighting an elite zero unit at these altitudes. Um, it, it's, it's just not the recipe for success. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I'm your host, Chris, and today I'm once again joined by our resident Pacific theater expert, Justin Pike. Welcome, Justin. Yeah, always happy to be here. Today, I thought we'd talk a little bit about the P-49, specifically the early operations in the South Pacific in 1942, and explain a little bit about why the aircraft has gotten such a poor reputation, especially among American pilots, and why that is relatively easy explainable if you look at both the aircraft in itself and the operational context and that doesn't mean that specifically the aircraft was bad or that the pilots were flying it were bad but the reputation that it garnered or got in the area uh, makes sense when you actually look for the reasons for it and that also provides a little bit of a contrast to of course the soviet opinion on the aircraft which was fairly positive but who used the aircraft in a completely and entirely different context before we get started, I want to take a quick moment to thank viewer and Patreon Errol Cavett, who has taken a lot of fantastic pictures of a P-46 restored at Pioneer Aero in New Zealand. He was so kind to allow me to use them in this video, which was a great help in getting some visuals for this plane. I've placed a link to his album in the description below, so make sure to check it out there as well. And if you have similar pictures of aircraft that you would like to give and allow me to use in future videos, please don't hesitate to contact me via social media. Links are in the description below. First, we have to look at the P-49, of course, as a plane. So I'll run down a couple of specs here and explain how the aircraft came to be as it is. Um, it's a very atypical aircraft, especially for sort of an American plane of the time. And it actually had quite a few advantages and unoffered uh, design and design uh, choices that made it into the aircraft that it was. So early on, there were a lot of hopes heaped on the P-49. It was going to be a very well-performing aircraft, very fast, very uh, maneuverable, uh, very you know, strong in, in terms of firepower. But with time and as the aircraft was developed, a lot of the hopes that were heaped on the aircraft essentially shrunk away. Now, the aircraft in itself, as it came out, had excellent armor. It, in fact, it was one, if not the best armored fighter aircraft, uh, especially single-engine fighter aircraft of the entire war. Um, it had good firepower with a 37mm cannon. There was also, of course, the P-400, which had a 20mm cannon. But overall, yes, the P-37mm uh, cannon, it had a low rate of fire, generally poor ballistics, and initially also there were some teething problems with the weapon. But overall, it was actually rather well regarded once the weapon's kinks were worked out. And uh, it had a tricycle landing gear, which is also very nice, um, makes especially on rough terrain things a lot easier. And it had a reasonable top speed and also a very strong di dive. Talking a little bit about the disadvantages here, we'll have, of course, to talk about the performance of the aircraft. I just said it had a reasonable top speed. Yes, that is at low altitude going in a straight line. But the Allison uh, V1710 uh, 1710 and different versions of that aircraft, uh, of that engine were of course used, um, didn't actually give the aircraft the performance that was needed. But that is perhaps not so much down to the aircraft's engine, although we'll have to talk about that specifically as well, but about the stuff that was put on the aircraft because of the armor and the weaponry that was of course put on the aircraft weighted down a lot. Um, it had a rather poor climb, especially compared to uh, some of the Japanese aircrafts of the time, which could be done away with, with a good early warning system, which didn't always work in 1942 in uh, New Guinea. And uh, the, the main disadvantage, however, of the aircraft was that it lacked a proper um, super or turbocharger at altitude. So when the aircraft was in its prototype stage, there was a two-stage turbocharger proposed, which was taken out of the aircraft. Instead, uh, it got a one-stage, one-speed supercharger. This essentially meant that the aircraft was limited to low to and medium altitudes because after 12,000 feet, and that's roughly 4,000 meters, the performance suffered a lot. And beyond that, another issue of the aircraft was its very limited range. So in the South Pacific, of course, we're talking about ranges that are quite significant and um, aircraft like the Zero were very well suited to the air environment in that regard. The P-49, not so much. So initially, as a prototype, it had internally 200 uh, gallons of fuel, and that went down to 120 with the P-49D, simply because the fuel tanks had to be uh, made uh, smaller 
especially because they were uh, to be self-sealing and that just took away of the volume. You can also not put any fuel tanks inside the fuselage of the aircraft because the fuselage is taken up up front by the cannon, then in the middle of course by the pilots and in the rear by the engine and the oil tank. I think the best way to illustrate this is to have a closer look at a plane's range and compare it to other planes. For this I am using the values given in the flight manuals. Let's start with the P-39D, which is representative of an early era Cobra used by the Allies in the Pacific. It is also very similar to the P-400, bar some changes for example to the armament. It has an internal fuel load of 120 US gallons, that's 450 liters. And on maximum continuous power at 12,000 feet, this gives it a range of 300 miles. By leaning out the mixture, you can extend that to a maximum of 640 miles. These are one-way trips, of course, so to get a feel for the combat radius, half the values and shave off an extra bit for warm-up, taxi, takeoff, loiter and, of course, your reserve. The manual actually omits 20 gallons itself, which I assume is mainly for ground consumption. With an auxiliary drop tank of 75 US gallons, that's 280 liters, range can then be increased to 435 and 830 miles, respectively. Now let's compare that to the P-40, because both planes used the same engine, although slightly different variants. It has an internal fuel load of 148 US gallons. The manual emits 30 gallons here. On max continuous at 9000 feet, the P-40 gets 325 miles, and for max range it is set at 700. And then with the drop tank of 75 US gallons, this increases to uh, 420 and 895 miles. The longer range of the P-40 can mainly be explained with a slightly better fuel capacity, but also what appears to be a better maximum range when using a lower power setting, which is quite interesting. Both planes are still quite limited then in terms of range in the southeastern Pacific theater. I'll draw up a quick example here. Take Port Moresby, for example. The distance here to the Japanese landing zones at Lai and Salamaua is 180 miles, give and take. This means that on paper, both planes have just enough fuel to fly there and double back straight away. And you better be praying for a tailwind of both stretches of your journey as well. This limits the use of the planes as escorts, but furthermore, this is just a clinical example. You know, if factoring in weather conditions, reserve fuel, loiter time, both the P-40 and the P-49 are essentially becoming a point defense aircraft in the region. The more the Japanese advance, the more the aircraft could be used in an air superiority role, but even then, range will still be an issue. Also, the P-49 was conceptualized as a bomber interceptor, or at least meant to be used as a high altitude interceptor, meaning that it was supposed to climb, which cuts away precious fuel and its performance at altitude really wasn't all that great. It is still, better, uh, it is still a better climber than the P-40, however. For example, comparing here to the time that it takes to go to uh, 15,000 feet, the P-49 takes between 5.9 to 7.4 minutes, depending on the load that you're carrying. And the P-40 takes 9.2 to 10.8 minutes. These times are still in favor of the P-49, but it is still about 1 to 1.5 minutes slower in a climb than some very similar aircraft of the time. And this slow climb, its intended role as an interceptor and the limitations of range and flight time paired with a limited early warning system prevents uh, some real limitations to this aircraft. And at this point, it might also serve to compare the plane to one of its adversaries. Yeah, so the Zero, of course, known for its operational range, it's probably its one outstanding characteristic. Um, so the Model 21, that's the A6M2, the famous zero people think of when you say zero. Yeah. Um, it had on internal fuel a, a range of 1,162 miles um, with a drop tank that went out to 1,927 miles. Uh, it, it's just huge. Um, I threw in as well the A6M3 and their Model 32 because that gets a reputation as being short ranged <laughs> in the Japanese Navy Air Service, um, and they would complain about it. Um, it had, with a drop tank, a range of 1,477 miles. And some people might say, well, you know, it's comparing apples to oranges here a little bit. The one thing is sort of a Navy fighter. The other thing is a, uh, well, yeah, land-based uh, 
interceptor, you might say, or ground attacker, depending on how you look at the aircraft. That is true. But you have to look at the fact that these aircraft were used in the same area and they were facing the same conditions. And in that fa- in that constellation, the range issue becomes quite tricky. And it's it sort of restricts what the aircraft can do. So, Justin, why, why don't you go ahead with that? Yeah, so because of the theater, um, more range is not necessarily about all about combat radius. I mean, of course, we were listing basically ferrying ranges, but that converts into a combat radius. It's also about safety margins. Um, Like you need to have fuel to climb over the Owen Stanleys or to get around the Owen Stanleys or to get around bad weather. Um, And since this isn't, say, uh, somewhere like Europe, like in France or something like that, where you might be able to limp back to um, an airfield that is relatively nearby or maybe even just dump it in a field or something like that. Um, This is New Guinea. Um, You're looking at shark infested waters or jungle (laughs) Um, with not too much uh, in between. So safety margins and things like that were really important and it could restrict the type of operations that you could conduct. Um, and there are lots of different examples of this. I mean, even to pick like a, a an example that's slightly outside the area, but very similar, um, the Japanese operations against Darwin when they were fighting Spitfires, there was literally one action where the Zeros flew several hundred miles in, conducted the mission and flew several hundred miles out. And instead of fighting the Spitfires, they just ran the Spitfires that had just taken off out of fuel. Um, so, it's a huge factor in this in this region. So then we also have to, of course, talk about operators because a machine is always a machine and you know how a machine is going to operate, provided that you, have, of course, have experience with it and you have to be aware of its advantages and also, of course, of its limitations. But one of the things that we should also say, perhaps, is that early on in the war, uh, this was the same with the U.S. Navy as also with uh, the Army Air Force, which had of course, just become the Army Air Force. It was the Army Air Corps in in 1941. Um, It was a very sort of dogfight-centric approach to air combat. It was sort of reminiscent, not entirely reminiscent, but sort of still inspired by that First World War experience, where it's very much one against one. Um, Of course, flying in formations, uh, taking care of your wingmen and so on and so forth, but it was very much dogfight-centric. And the American experience was both in the Navy and the Air Force, that that doesn't really work in the South Pacific, especially against Japanese aircraft, but you still have to have a learning experience before you can actually implement the lessons that you learn. And the P-49 early on with the pilots that are flying these machines, they are the first Americans to be essentially pulled into this war. And um, they, they are the ones that are actually living through this experience, which means that they are also going to be the ones that are suffering by the limitations of, for example, their, their approach or their, their, the training and the doctrine that has been hammered into them ever since they've become pilots. And I think you also mentioned to me earlier that the P-49s on New Guinea, they have specifically bad luck in a way of who they're actually facing. In New Guinea, of course, in in the dark days in 1942, it was thrust into this fighter, basically interceptor role, because the the broader context that I guess we we didn't really mention is that for the most part, what it's doing is intercepting high altitude bomber formations escorted by zeros. So already we're we're talking about high altitude, which is already going to be a struggle. They're fighting an elite zero unit at these altitudes. Um, It's it's just not the recipe for success. These unfortunate P-39s are facing one of, if not the most elite fighter unit in the Japanese Navy, the Tainan Kokutai. Um, Many of their pilots are very experienced, um, and they'd gained this experience very recently because they had been heavily involved in uh, ripping allied air power to shreds in the Dutch East Indies. Um, And of course, uh, many of the pilots had uh, China experience before that. Um, They exhibited consistently excellent teamwork and situational awareness. They were, they were basically a crack unit. Um, So it was not, uh, they they weren't fighting um, some, a a unit that was like maybe a little bit further down the rungs. They were fighting kind of the best of the best. Um, And I guess to drive this point home really is before the P-39s really become heavily engaged, uh, the Royal Australian Air Force Number 75 Squadron, um, which was equipped with P-40Es, 
in the words of Michael Claringbold, quote, fought itself into oblivion, end quote, uh, in just 40, uh, 44 days against fourth uh, and Tainan Kokutai zeros. Um, one, th- one little thing I, w- I do want to note is that it was almost mutual because the Tainan Kokutai zeros, uh, or the Tainan Kokutai was actually badly down on strength um, in the aftermath of this. So again, this this broader context of, I mean, both sides basically fought each other to a standstill briefly and had to sit around for reinforcements. On the Allied side, the reinforcements were these P-39 equipped uh, formations. So as far as overclaiming, again, rears its head um, versus actual results, um, in 1942, 44 Era Cobras were lost in combat to 15 zeros. So that's a loss ratio of about three to one. Uh, Era Cobras were credited with 95 zero kills, which was a claim to kill ratio of 6.3 to one. Um, the Japanese don't get to laugh either because their overclaiming was similar, um, but it's still a conv- very convincing uh, victory for the Japanese, at least as far as pure air-to-air fighter combat is concerned. Um, and this leads into the poor reputation that the P-39 began to develop. I mean, it started picking up lots of nicknames. The P-400 uh, is my favorite little saying is... Um, the P-400 was a P-40 with a zero on its tail, which I think is one of the cleverest things yeah. I, I related to aircraft I've seen. Um, uh, the P-39 also picked up like a, a nickname like Iron Dog, um, other things like that. And he, he, that that really, we should really have a look at that as well, because once a plane or a, a, a piece of equipment has a certain reputation, even if that aircraft or if that piece of equipment improves over time, it still has to essentially overcome that reputation that it has gathered over the years. And that is very hard to come, or that's very hard to go against, especially as new aircraft start to appear. And of course, pilots always want to fly the newest models. So there's there's probably also a certain element of these P-39 squadrons uh, being stuck with the aircraft and they're starting to see more modern, more capable aircraft coming out and they want to transition to those rather than being stuck in their aircraft. In the end of the day, though, I think the reputation of the plane, at least uh, when it comes to the American side, is more based on sort of the context of its use in New Guinea uh, rather than the plane's abilities or even the pilot's abilities. Um, but this really goes for almost any aircraft, if not all aircraft in any sort of combat environment you know context is essential you always have to look at that beyond sort of the technical characteristics that nowadays we like to emphasize what did the americans do with the p-39s once they sort of started getting a grip of the aircraft of what they can do with it yeah so it started to actually become useful primarily for ground support i mean it was a pretty capable strafer um, and it could carry a a respectable bomb load as well when it transitions into a more of a low level ground attack role it performs much better and even as a fighter uh when the americans start bringing in newer models like the p-38 and things like that they perform higher up the p-39 could you know uh skimming treetops happily um and in that area, even if they came up against some fighters, the plane was going to give a much better account of itself than it did um, trying to intercept formation, bomber formation. Definitely, yeah. Right, awesome. So thanks very much, Justin. If people are interested now about you know the P-39, especially in the South Pacific, what are sort of the reading recommendations you would give to what people can turn to? Yeah, so there's actually a few excellent books. This is Eric Berger, Good Fire in the Sky for Overall Context. Um, specifically for P-39-400, um, if you're, if you want something really small, like pretty much you can read it in one sitting, uh, P-39, P-40, Air Cobra versus A-6-7-2-3-0 saying New Guinea 1942, uh, it's an Osprey, uh, by, M- uh, Michael Claringbold. So it's kind of a, basically a short summation of his work. Um, if you're looking for something that's a bit thicker, but yeah, South Pacific Air War Volume Three specifically is when the P-39s become involved. Although I would recommend, because as we've been driving home, context is so important. Just start right at Volume One and go through, and you get a much better feel for the the dynamics um, within the theater, um, and that'll give you a very good idea of how a plane like the P-39 in this very specific operational environment can develop the reputation that it did. Right. Excellent. Thanks very much. I will pop those reading recommendations also in the uh, description if you guys want to have a look. Um, I will very quickly go over uh, 
why the Soviets thought you know the P thirty nine was good compared to what you just heard about the Americans. Again, it it, it it's the context that matters. The, the planes, uh, yes, they also got later models that were more powerful, and of course they also got the P sixty three, the King Cobra. Um, but what the Soviets did is a couple of things. First of all, uh, the operational context, um, the engagements that were on the Eastern Front were on more short range, were fought on the short range, so they didn't really meet the range that was problematic in uh, New Guinea, for example. A lot more low altitude action, which the aircraft was better suited for. Um, lots of systems that were inside a P-49 were new to Soviet pilots so um, and were very appreciated, like, for example, a uh, proper heating system or uh, a working radio. Some quality of life improvements that, that were really well liked. Of course, the armament was also something that they appreciated. But specifically also they do something that the Americans pilots don't do, the American squadrons don't do, and they say they are way more aggressive in the way they modify the aircraft. So on a lot of these aircraft, they also take some of the guns out to lighten them, they take some of the armor out to lighten them, and then of course the plane is going to be performing somewhat better. Um, so that gives you sort of an introduction into why the Soviets like the aircraft compared to the Americans. But of course you can go into more detail when, when it comes to that, but uh, for that we'll, we'll point you to the literature of course that is in the description as always. So yeah, Justin, thanks very much for joining. And as always, I hope you guys have a great day and see you in the sky. And oh, and Justin, where can people find you on Twitter if they have questions? Oh, uh, at CBI underscore PTO underscore history. The best Twitter handle in the history of Twitter. <laughs> All right, take care. Thank you very much. As always, uh, Justin is our man to go. <laughs> our no, man to go. <laughs> <laughs> It's our man to go. You're our man to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One last time.